We'll go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 3. If you've been with us, we've been in Ephesians the last several weeks. We've got several weeks more to go. We're kind of uh, approaching the halfway point here. Uh, But we're in this, this letter. It's tenderly written by the Apostle Paul to the church that he loves so dearly. And it's, it's a church that he's urging not to lose heart. Despite the challenges, the fears, heartaches, whatever it is, do not lose heart. Sounds relevant, right? In three, chapter 3, verse 13, he says, So I ask you not to lose heart. So why does Paul say that? We need to understand that. What, like, what's he worried about the, for, for them? And what is his response to their heartache? Well, to understand that, we need to do a quick review of the first half of chapter 3. And, and so last week, we took a break from our series, so we missed kind of the first half of chapter 3. I'm going to try to fill us in a little bit, but if you, you know, feel shortchanged on Ephesians, you can listen to one of our other uh, campuses and hear that first section of, of chapter 3. But let me kind of summarize a little bit the first half, because Paul begins chapter 3 by reminding them that he is a prisoner. Like that he's writing from prison because of his faith in Jesus, okay? Chapter three, verse one, Paul writes, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And then he goes on to unpack in in the rest of chapter three, the rest of the first half, uh, this thing he keeps referring to as the mystery of Christ. It's come up a few times, the mystery of Christ, right? And the mystery of Christ, like he makes it so clear, especially here, the mystery of Christ is us. Like we, we are the mystery, the church, that the, that the Jewish Messiah is the Gentile Savior. Like, who would come up with that plan, right? To put us together. Like, it, this is unthinkable. And in, in the first century, these two groups, Jew and Gentile, had never willingly associated with one another, ever. Culturally, they had no business being together. But they are now one and the same family which is crazy, right? It's a mystery. But it's also really, really good news because most of us here are Gentiles, right? We are the outsiders in this story. And this, this is why we continue to believe that God tears down walls of, of race and ethnicity, socioeconomics, politics, broken marriages, broken relationships, the many things that divide us. The infinite wall between us and God has been torn down by the blood of Jesus And the wall that existed between Jew and Gentile for millennia has been torn down. And this is his big mystery. That his church, this ragtag group of mismatched people, now the family of God, who don't always look alike uh, or speak the same language or share the same hobbies or vote the same way, this group of people who from a human perspective you wouldn't think would even ever be in the same room together. We are God's plan to redeem the world. That's what Paul's getting at here in, in the first half of chapter three. That w- Paul says, we are God's wisdom, even though it looks so foolish. That we are God's victory, even though it smells like defeat. And that we are God's healing, even though we, we ourselves are so desperately in need of healing. So you can see why Paul calls this a mystery, can't you? I mean, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. And it's actually made worse by the fact that Paul is writing this from prison. I mean, isn't it? I mean, so so essentially what what he's saying here is like, hey, church, I, I know I'm in jail, okay? It's not great. I don't love being there. And I know, I know you're basically, in this first century, you're basically just a small group of people who can barely even get along. I mean, this Jew-Gentile thing was really, really hard. I know you have zero power, politically, socially, economically, culturally, and that most people right now, they, they, either, you know, they either misunderstand you at best or hate you at worst. And if I'm really honest, you're going to be joining me in suffering pretty soon. I mean, this is all what Paul is getting at. But what are you worried about? It's just a little prison. We are God's victory to redeem the world. Of course you'll suffer. But God's got this. I mean, think of the audacity of Paul to write this while he's in prison, right? So I ask you, he says, do not lose heart. So you're with me so far. This is kind of a quick summary of, of the first half of chapter three. But this isn't, this isn't just like some pep talk for the Ephesian church. Like, rah, rah, 
ignore your pain. It's not really that bad. Like that's, that's not really what's happening here. They are, they are deeply in need of something, and they are truly at risk of losing heart. And he doesn't want that for his church. So what does he do? Two things in this next passage. He prays and he expects. Which brings us to our scripture reading uh, this morning. And so I'm going to actually ask you to go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's word. I'm going to read the whole thing now. This is, this is our passage. So that was a summary of the, of the last week. Um, and then we'll look at this together. Our, our scripture reading this morning is Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses 13 through 21. Paul writes, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Okay, so maybe that passage is familiar to some of you. Maybe, maybe not. It's one of the great sort of prayers, great benedictions in, in all of Scripture. It's incredible, right? Uh, but essentially is around those two things. Paul encouraging the church not to lose heart. He prays and he expects. And so in verse, verse 14, right, it be, he begins with, with who God is as our Father, the Father from whom all the families on earth are named. I mean, this is a statement of God's authority, his sovereignty, that all of us belong to him. And, and as such, we bow before him, right? I bow before the Father in submission and in trust, and no matter what, because we know that he cares for us, that he's a good father for us. And then he prays. But what, is, what does he pray? I mean, it's a lot of words, right? Paul's pretty wordy. He loves, he loves kind of these wordy prayers. They're beautiful, but it's a little wordy. Like, what would you pray if you were Paul? I'd pray that I'd get out of jail, right? Like, hey, everybody, join me in praying that I get out of jail, right? That's what I would want to say, right? And he does that in different places, but that's, that's not what he does here. I mean, I, I'd be tempted to pray in this situation, like calmer waters, right? Easier days, simpler times, which is so often what we think, so often what I think. God, I'm at risk of losing heart, and so would you please make my life a little easier? How often have we said that, right? You've said it, I've said it. God, I'm at risk of losing heart. Just give me a little more comfort. Take away some of the hard stuff. I mean, anybody, anybody else in those moments, like maybe even in this moment, like, like just, if you're anxious about losing heart, just want to say, God, just make it a little easier, would you? It's not wrong to pray that. I mean, certainly it's not wrong. I mean, Jesus tells us to pray like little children, and children have no hesitation asking for anything they think they need or want, right? That's what Jesus tells us to do. And so it's okay to to bring all of those things to God, right? All of those requests. Of course we do. But none of that is what we need the most. Often in the moment, it's what we think we need the most, right? Would you just answer my problem, please, Jesus? It's not what we need the most. Instead, here's what Paul prays. Verse 16, he says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. First of all, I like, stop there. Like, yes, like that, there it is. I want that power, strength, endurance, victory. Like that sounds great, Paul. Give me some of that. But it's not, it's not what you think. Not what I would think. Strength, strength for what? Verse 17. This is what the strength is for. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Again, it's a mouthful, right? It's a lot of words, but it's not complicated. Verse 17 begins and verse 19 ends with basically the same request, right? 
This this will help kind of frame it for us. Verse 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And verse 19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's It's a request for God's nearness. That he would be so close to you that he would actually fill you with his presence. Are you with me? I mean, even, like, just think about how big God is, first of all, right? He cannot be confined or limited. There are no dimensional boundaries for God. He is everywhere, all the time, always. And yet Paul prays that his boundless fullness would dwell within each one of us. It's pretty cool, right? Right? I mean, it's sort of like asking God to cram the entire ocean into a single swimming pool, right? Or the entire atmosphere into a balloon, but even even more so because God is infinite and he's asking that he would do it for all of us. You get his fullness and you get his fullness. And and so it's, it's it's a prayer for God's presence, but it's still more than that. I mean, if this if this prayer or a sandwich, that'd be the bread part, okay? Um, dwell in your heart, filled with all the fullness of God, the presence of God, right? That's the bread. But the meat and cheese right in the middle, verse 17, it's all about God's love. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Again, it's kind of a mouthful, right? But it's not, it's not complicated. In fact, it's so simple. And it's, it's the very thing you and I need most in the world. I don't think I'm exaggerating here. Like, there, there's nothing in the universe that I need more. There's nothing that'll satisfy you more or carry you more in times of hardship. It is what you need most. It's what I need most. It's what every person you ever meet always needs the most. And it's not more comfort. It's not an easier life or a little bit of safety. It's not money or stuff or affirmation or applause or good health or a good family, a long life, perfect kids. We're a much-needed vacation. Like all the things that we run to, to to tell us that it's going to be okay. What everyone needs most, what every human you ever need, meet needs most is this. And if you take one thing with you today, I hope it's this. What, what all of us always need most is to be held by God's unending love. That's it. If you want to know what you need, what I need, what all of us need, that's it. What all of us always need most is to be held by God's unending love. That we would be rooted and grounded in love. I love that imagery, right? That we would, like a tree, rooted deep into the soil of God's, of God's love, right? That we would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I mean, just, so just as he prays that God's infinite fullness would dwell in us finite humans. He prays that we would know that which surpasses knowledge, which is Jesus' love. It's like, it's just, it's beyond us. But that, but that, word, that word surpasses here, it doesn't mean it's unknowable. It means more like that we'll never get to the end of knowing it. I love it. I love that, right? Like that, that it's, that God's love is like a daily discovery. There's always something new. There's always a fresh encounter, even in eternity. We'll never get bored with discovering his love for us. Now, there's always something new and beautiful to experience when we're held by his love. As I was thinking about this this week, I kind of was thinking back, and the older, the older I get, the more my prayers have changed over time. I mean, I still pray for a lot of the same normal stuff. I mean, some of that never, never goes away. Some of those basic things that probably you pray for as well. I, I still do some of that. And maybe, and maybe I've prayed with some of you over the years, and maybe you've picked up on some of these changes. But, but as, a, as a younger pastor, I think I'd get right to the point. Okay, they, they have this problem. Let's, let's pray for this problem, right? And so God, help them with X. Heal them with X, right? Whatever X is. And X matters, okay? It's not, not, not to minimize X, right? And that's okay. It's okay to pray that. But then maybe, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, I don't remember exactly, but as I was thinking about this week, um, and after I'd learned a little bit about the depth of my own pain, my own wounds, my own hurts, right, and the depth of people's experiences, of how, how much grief and heartache we carry into every situation, right, all of us have so much that we're bearing. Like, what I came to realize, I'd still pray for X, right, because X still matters, But then I'd almost always end with some version of these words and give them a supernatural ability to trust in you. 
Because trust is, is always at the heart of the matter for all of us. That's still so important. I'm not minimizing that. But that was, that was what it was maybe 10 or 12 years ago. But then a few years ago, I switched even that. I can't remember when or why or how. I think, again, it probably had to do with some of my own self-awareness of my own junk, right? And the more I discovered things such like attachment theory and uh, neurobiology, all of those kinds of, kinds of things, I think probably shaped some of this. And maybe just having a few more birthdays. But it really came with the realization that all of us at our very core, what we want more than anything is simply to know that somebody loves us. Right? Like, is there any, is there any, like, we're not alone in the universe. Like, is there anything any of us want more? Like, that is it at the very core of our being. And, and even how, how scientists talk about how we, we come into the world looking for someone who's looking for us. Like, even as infants, like, that's part of who we are. We're, we're constantly searching, constantly reaching. And even, like, that never goes away. Like, that experience you have when you walk into your room and somebody's eyes light up, right? Because you know you're wanted. You know you belong. You know you're loved. Like, that craving that we have, right, deep within us, when you know that you are seen, truly seen, and loved anyway. And the flip side of that, I mean, the thing that we're most afraid of Maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, right? That fear behind every fear is being alone, being found out. That at the end of the day, everyone is going to leave you, right? If they really knew you, if they could really see who you are, they couldn't possibly want you. And people, I love solitude, right? I love solitude. I'm terrified of being alone. I love, I love a little me time, but I hate the feeling of being isolated, right? Left out, abandoned, unwanted. And so if you prayed with me in the past few years, or maybe you've picked this up in some of my preaching, what do I pray most now more than anything else in the world? It's like a broken record anymore. I just pray, God, be near them. Remind them that you love them. More more than anything else, I pray that for myself, I pray that for my wife, my kids, the people I care about, for for each of you, right? It's just, God, would you just tell them that you will never walk out on the room on them, no matter matter what happens, no matter how, how bad it gets, no matter how many mistakes they make, that you will never stop loving them. Which is essentially what Paul is praying right here. That's his prayer for this Ephesian church. That's his prayer for us. And the beauty of this prayer, church, is that it's also a promise. Which is why Paul both prays and he expects. He expects. And he doesn't, he doesn't just expect God to kind of do it. I mean, it's kind of what we tend to think. Like, God, well, just a little bit. Like, God will come through just enough or something like. like we imagine God up there. like, okay, here's a little bit of love. It's like, good grief, you humans are so needy. I sent you my son already. Wasn't that enough, right? Like, like some terrible spouse who says, well, I told you I loved you at our wedding, right? Isn't that enough? It's terrible, right? But we think God's like that, don't we? It's like, well, I sent you my son. What else do you need from me, people, Right? It's kind of what we think of God, if we're completely honest, that he's going to be stingy with his love, that he's going to be withholding with his love and his goodness to us, especially when life is hard or when our own mistakes begin to catch up with us. But how many times has Paul already said in Ephesians how incredibly rich God is? Have you picked that up as we've gone, on, gone through this? Let me just review so far what we've heard. Chapter 1, verse 7, riches of his grace, then riches of his glorious inheritance, rich in mercy, riches of his grace and kindness, riches of Christ, riches of his glory. God is loaded, people. I mean, he's just, he's flesh, right? And he will never be stingy with you. He will never withhold from you what you truly need, what he believes is truly best for you. Never. There's nothing that you lack that he won't somehow make up for. And so it it makes sense then, right? Knowing this backdrop of how rich God is in his kindness and love, it makes sense that after Paul prays that we would be held forever by God's unending love, that he expects God to actually do it. I mean, he says it right here, right? Again, the, the context... Basically, Paul, he's getting at, like, God, please hold them with your unending love so that they do not lose heart. And then verse 20. 
now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Which means whatever you expect from God, it's not enough. He wants to give you more. And ultimately, he wants to give you more of himself, more of his presence, and more of his love. And he will never walk out on you. He will never leave you. He's never disappointed in you. He sees all of you, everything about you, and loves you far more abundantly than we could even ask or think. Maybe that just feels like pie in the sky, or maybe you're like stuck in the spot of, yeah, but how do, I, how do I get there? How do I feel that? It sounds great. I'd love that. How do we experience it, especially when things are hard? Well, it's mostly through one another, isn't it? Most often, that's how we experience God's love, is through one another. We, we need one another to know and experience God's love. We need the family. And so we feel it at church when somebody remembers our name, don't we? Don't you love that, right? We feel it when their face lights up when they see you, right? We feel it when someone recognizes you're hurting and just encourages you or prays with you or just holds you. And as I said at the start, I know the Olathe staff felt it from so many of you this week. There were so many text messages, emails, flowers, goodies, Offers the help, which, by the way, we need. Um, so many of you prayed. I know, I know that's true in our praying. You have been God's love to us and to each other, and we're so grateful. One of the texts I received uh, this week was so simple. It came on Monday night. It said, Nathan just wanted to quickly point out that the sun did rise this morning. Thanks, Joel. Another friend prayed with me and simply said, I don't even know what to ask, and so God, would you just hold us? Thank you, Gabe. And good old Nancy Steers, if you don't know Nancy, she's one of the best humans God made, uh, truly. Her signature on every email that she sends, I always read it. And who reads email signatures, right? But everyone from from Nancy I read, every email from her ends with this. God made you, so he could love you. That is a truth to build your life on.